There you go. Where you going back there? All right, how's everyone doing? Everyone back from snow, but okay? Anybody have any major issues? No one went. No one went to the hospital. Did y'all go sledding? No? All right. Um, so it's been. It seems like it's been almost a month since we've been in class. And the last time, last class, did you get a haircut too? Uh, okay. Because we all had to get a haircut at some point. <laughs> it just, mm. You looking you looking clean on the sides there. Um, so it has been a minute since we were in some sort of class. I think the last time that we were in class, we uh, went over the Russell again, um, and we also have presentations coming up that are going to kind of talk about some of the things we might mention today. Uh, but we will be trying to move forward into module two. Um, so this is probably going back at least two or three weeks uh, where we finished up with um, how to control runoff and adding a retention wall um, and some sort of riprap. Um, and then moving into today's notes, um, there are some ways that we can minimize this water erosion. I've lost my clicker, it's driving me nuts. Um, but a couple of those ways, first primarily is going to be to um, minimize that Impact on raindrops. Did you? Cool. That's even better. That's what's up. I'm only one short. Um, is to minimize that raindrop impact. Um, so any type of cover crop or some sort of mulch or something that is going to either um, kind of stop that that 30 mile or 30 kilometer per hour uh, raindrop and um, hold on to some of that water. Those mulches are going to hold on to water. Um, they're going to allow, their, well first they'll absorb some of that water and then they will allow some infiltration because if infiltration exceeds, or if rainfall exceeds infiltration, then we have runoff, correct? So if we can keep that water at least on top of our crop instead of in the ditch, we can um, potentially increase our infiltration. Um, some other ways would be to reduce the runoff volume. Um, and we're going to talk about most of those today being diversions, um, terraces, and grassed waterways. And so these are some of the, the uh, practical application of what we would do in a situation where we are uh, on a slope of some sort that is um, causing us some erosion problems. And ultimately the goal is to improve or increase the resistance to erosion. Um, some of those things that can be done would be like increasing organic matter um, and having some sort of plant uh, material on site that is going to have a root structure that is going to hold that soil in place better. Um, so a couple of the things that those cover crops and mulches are going to do. Um, anytime that we're adding any kind of organic material back to our soil, uh, we're going to uh, help those soil properties, soil structure, bulk density, we can't do too much about texture, but that will improve some of the water quality. Uh, we will start to uh, remove some of those purities, the impurities in the water. Having cover crops is going to enhance our soil fertility. It's going to recycle some of those nutrients and ultimately increase our crop yields. I don't know how you do it, John, but you do, brother. Everyone good on the slide? All right. So next, 
We want to reduce that uh, runoff volume, so maybe we make a ditch or a channel, uh, something that is going to kind of focus where that water goes. Uh, I know I'm not presenting anything that anyone hasn't seen before. Um, Uh, but what's important about these uh, diversions and these drainage ditches is that we uh, make sure that we want to have uh, uh, that they can handle the amount of rainfall that's going to be focused there. Uh, so while uh, we have a 10 year frequency rainstorm, um, it might not have been a 10 year frequency rainstorm when it, when it uh, actually occurred. It might only be a five. But remember, we are channeling most of that water towards this one spot. So now we've increased the actual intensity of the rainstorm because we're focusing most of that water in that area. Um, I remember when I took soil and water, we focused more on these types of things, like the, the structures and the engineering aspect of like how to actually design these. Um, I don't necessarily believe that y'all will be designing them, but you'll be working with the people who will design them. They will have some sort of engineer on site uh, for your company. Um, in RCS, y'all have engineers that do this, don't you? You can work with them and say, hey, we need a we need a, a ditch here and we have this much rainfall. Um, so I guess from an ag standpoint, um, you'll be working with someone and not necessarily needing to know uh, a lot of the engineering aspects of how, how big it needs to be or how much water it needs to handle. Uh, just know that um, you're going to be concentrating this water from this rainstorm towards a specific point and it needs to be able to handle something more than what you're experiencing as far as rainfall intensity goes. When we're building terraces, uh, which was one of our uh, primary ways, I know I showed several uh, examples of terraces. Um, most of those are in very mountainous areas, not necessarily like Tennessee. But we kind of characterize those in four, in, uh, four classifications. Um, and then also there are going to be some uh, kind of parameters that we would use this type versus that type in it. So as we get into the application, the question might be, you are in a low rainfall area with a moderately permeable soil um, on greater than 20 inch slopes, or uh, greater than 20% slopes. Um, which one of these terraces would you use? For our primary function, it's going to be whether or not we're going to try to retain the water or divert the water. The construction process being channel or ridge, again, you will have someone else that does this for you. They will design the, the terrace. You will just say, you need to make this type of terrace right here. They'll design the ridge and what the angle, the toe, all of those things need to be. But having an understanding of when and where to use these is what they're paying you for. So this is a rice paddy in some very steep uh, location where they're trying to keep that water on site. They need it in order to uh, flood their rice, or maybe they need it in order because um, they're trying to use it as an irrigation for some crop. Um, and these are used in low rainfall areas where the soil permeability is high and our slopes are going to be less than 8%. And so we see they have this ridge here that is stopping that water. They almost make like a trough. Um, that ridge is retaining the water in, in this channel. Uh, the base is maybe, I don't know, three or four meters. Um, and that water is going to remain there until it infiltrates the soil. So as long as it's going in the soil, it's not going in the ditch. And if it's not going in the ditch, it's not bringing any soil with it. Uh, 
Um, next, we would have a, diver um, a diversion or a graded or sloping terrace. Um, and this is going to move the water towards a central location uh, so that it can be removed from the system. Uh, because we have uh, moderately permeable soils with a lot of rainfall, I mean, our slopes would be somewhere between 8 and 20 percent. So roughly about less than 10 percent, you would want to use a retention, um, a retention terrace. Somewhere between 10 and 20, you would want to use a sloping terrace where you can slowly but gradually move that water uh, off site. Next, we would have the construction process where there's going to be a channel or a ridge. Again, um, high rainfall areas with low to medium permeability and slopes of about 20% or slopes up to 20%. Uh, not really sure where you would get into uh, areas as uh, maybe around here where you're farming or on a slope greater than 20 percent. You're in some trouble there. Um, probably pick a different profession. I mean, then we would have a ridge, uh, and this is where we're going to have a high permeable soil, much like we saw with the retention terrace, where we're going to at least be able to hold that water until it can actually infiltrate the soil and percolate through the profile and will finally move to the water table. Some of you might have seen this where you have a grass waterway where we have diverted the water to a central location uh, or a ridge that moves that water uh, out of the field in one area. Uh, they're typically planted with um, perennial grass because we want that to grow back. We don't want to, well, we don't want to have to replant that every year. Um, so a perennial grass that would grow back is going to help um, filter those sediments and those nutrients, but still allow the water to leave the field. Remember our goal is to keep the soil out of the ditch. And we want to make sure that our grass waterways are not a gully so that you can drive your equipment across them. Um, and so they have, um, you want to make them fairly wide with a moderate kind of swell uh, so that you can still get your equipment across. And so that is typically no more than two times the width being no more than two times the height of the grass waterway. And putting all of that together, we can see we have a graded channel sloping towards our grass waterway that is removing the water off the field. So it's in one central location, and then the water can move that way. And then on the right, uh, we also have grass waterways running through the middle of our field. So that's it for, at least for the most part, for water erosion. Uh, moving on to wind. Um, in the 30s, I was not there during that time, and some of you might think that I was. Um, but, uh, you know, before agriculture really took off, they didn't have a lot of, there wasn't a lot of grass growing. They weren't, they weren't trying to keep the soil in place. It wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, but when the wind started picking up and started moving the soil, uh, kind of turned some heads and said, hey, you know what, maybe we need to do some things about uh, making sure that we keep our soil in this place. I mean, much like our uh, Russell, there is a wind equation with a few different components, but pretty much the same um, thought processes. With our soil erodibility, and we're going to have some climate factor, which would be kind of similar to our rainfall. The soil ridges, how rough the field is, the rougher the field, the less likely 
Um, the wind is going to move across that very quickly. How wide the field is. And then also what kind of vegetative cover that we have there. Everyone good? Let's see if this video works for me. One day I'm going to learn not to do this. Okay, no more videos, lesson learned. Um, with our wind erosion, we have the same mechanics as our water erosion, where we have detachment, there's going to be some movement of the soil particles, of the transportation, and then finally it will be deposited. There are three components to wind erosion. The first being saltation, where the soil is moved by small bounces that accounts for about 50% of our wind erosion. Next we have soil creep, where there's just kind of this slow movement of wind of, of soil uh, along the surface. And then the rest would be suspended in the air. <clears throat> A diagram just explaining the uh, components of wind erosion. I'll we'll probably need that for a homework assignment coming up. Wind erosion is going to impact uh, our soil texture because we're moving we're moving soil particles. When we move soil particles that have nutrients attached to them, we're moving our nutrients as well, which is going to decrease productivity. We're finally moving our finer textured soils because they're lighter and therefore can be suspended in the air. And when we do that, we are left with coarse textured, less fertile soils. Um, and we are also losing our soil depth. Is that in the U.S. every year or yeah. worldwide? Uh, I think that would probably just be in the U.S. But remember, for water erosion, we had how many billion tons in the U.S.? So, comparatively, a much smaller percentage. Some of the damage that can happen from erosion is going to be abrasion of our crops or our plant material and that tomato is probably not going to sell or whatever fruit that is is probably not going to sell very well market there's air pollution uh, which is going to carry some of those toxic substances that may be attached to the soil that's going to impede our vision um, I don't necessarily know that we have very much of that problem out here but maybe in West Texas they would um, where there aren't many trees and there's a lot of sand. And then finally, deposition. Um, I am from the coast of Mississippi, and so every once in a while they will have to come by and clean the roads um, from after, yeah, because it, the sand blows onto the highway, and that can cause problems too. Uh, so every once in a while they'll have to come by and kind of scrape that off, much like they do the snow in Tennessee. 
Um, and that can be expensive to remove. Some of the factors that are going to affect that are going to be how fast the wind is blowing, so uh, velocity and turbulence, the movement of the wind. Um, is that laminar or is it uh, non-laminar? Um, the roughness of our surface, soil properties, whether that be texture, um, compaction, and then finally vegetation. factors that are going to influence this wind erosion, number one being soil moisture. Anyone think of why soil moisture might have an influence on wind erosion? Josh. Correct. There you go. Did you have something else this year? Nope. Same thing. Right? So the heavier the soil, the harder it is to move. So soil moisture, if we can keep it somewhat moist, it's going to stay on the ground. Um, I was stationed in Bosnia, and uh, we lived in these sea huts, and when we're tracking the soil in, or the dirt, and this place soil, or our boots, uh, every once in a while we have to sweep up our sea hut that is, has just wood on the floor. Well, there's a lot of dust in there, there's a lot of dirt. And so what we would do is we would either sprinkle like sawdust, dry sweep, but you know, they weren't issuing that. So we would spray water. And we would basically just be pushing mud around, but it would stop the soil from, or the dirt from being lifted up into the air that we were breathing. And you got eight guys living in about this much space, all breathing in sandy soil. Um, tillage, tillage is going to affect that. Um, the rougher the surface, the less likely the wind, um, the less uh, velocity and turbulence that the wind has moving over that surface. Um, and so we kind of get in this uh, in this conundrum where we don't want to till, but we also don't want to have a smooth surface because that's going to increase, um, it's going to de actually decrease the friction of the particles moving across the field. And then finally we want to put some kind of barrier up so that we can at least minimize most of the uh, wind erosion around our house. So we want to add some wind breaks. And what these wind breaks are going to do, obviously, is going to decrease the velocity and the flow of the wind. Two kinds, tree wind breaks and grass. Uh, tree wind breaks will provide some sort of protection for about 10 times the height of the trees. And grass wind breaks about half of that, mainly because they were more flexible um, and they won't be able to deflect that wind as much as a as a tree would. Um, and so just a couple of pictures, kind of showing um, some of the possible ways that you could use wind breaks. I really like the bottom right picture. Just kind of protecting on both sides our very um, succulent plant that is in our plastic mulch and probably with drip irrigation. Um, so we're not really worried about uh, any soil erosion in there, right? Because our plant is, the, the plastic mulch is covering the, the soil from moving. But we don't want any wind erosion or um, to carry any soil particles and abrase, have some abrasions on our plants. Everyone good on water and wind erosion? Uh, there will be some Russell calculations um, in the upcoming homework. We'll discuss that at the end of class. Um, and then also this is going to be a part of the homework as well on how to go about conservation planning. And I should probably have Michaela up here teaching this. She probably knows about it better than I do. Um, there are nine steps. These are all kind of pretty much common sense. 
Um, I'm not bringing anything new to the table. We need to identify the problem first. Is there a problem? What kind of problem is it going to be? How big of a problem? Um, who determines on whether or not it's a problem? We want to determine the objectives. Michaela calls me up and says, hey, we have a problem. And I go, how would you like me to solve that? And she says, we need these three things to happen because I'm afraid that I'm going to lose whatever a house, um, a hillside, whichever. Next, we need to know what kind of resources that we have in order to combat this problem. Um, and this really just looks like brainstorming. What all do we have? Well, we've got a tractor, uh, we've got uh, some mulch. I'm not going to be able to do very much for you, Michaela. We've only got a tractor and some mulch. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to analyze some of those resources, find out which ones are best suited for our situation. So information gathering and then information evaluation. Um, these meetings take a while, I would assume, because everyone's trying to figure out which ones we actually need and which ones we don't. Next, we'll formulate the alternatives. What can we do? This is a brainstorming where you come up with the craziest thing that you can possibly think of and then your boss tells you that that's not good enough. And then they'll tell you what they want to do. That's probably how that goes. It's exactly how it goes, doesn't it? Well, we know nothing, so. What's that? We know nothing, we just started now. Yeah. The boss will make the decision. <laughs> you will get your shovel and head off to go implement the plan with your tractor and your mulch. And then eventually they'll evaluate that plan and determine on whether or not they need to re, um, revisit the issue uh, and come up with a different plan, which sometimes has to happen. Um, not every plan is a good one. Um, but in trying something, we will learn something and come up with a different plan and we know what doesn't work. It's not that I'm an expert at what works, but I can certainly tell you what doesn't work. I have enough experience with, uh, with some things about what not to do, um, how to go about that. Um, so that is going to be first part with the collection and the analysis. Um, and that'll go back and forth. Um, those arrows showing that it's not just a very linear process. There's, oh, uh, well, what if we do this? And what if we do that? Um, someone will finally make the decision and then there will be some application and, excuse me, some evaluation or reevaluation. One of the first things that you can do um, is I don't think there's going to be very much writing in this, but um, we will be using WebSoil Survey for our homework, but it is one of the very first tools that you can use to determine what the situation looks like, what you're dealing with without ever even showing up to the site. So Peyton calls me up and says, hey, Natras, I need you to come. I got a problem on my land, and I go, well, where's it at? He goes out in the middle of nowhere, here's some GPS coordinates. And I go on to Web Soil Survey, and I can find out at least something about the land. I can know the soil type. I can look up slopes. Um, and next Thursday, or this Thursday, bring your laptop, if you have one. Um, and we are going to kind of walk through how to navigate Web Soil Survey. Anybody use Web Soil Survey? I know my soils class has. Um, but... For those who have it, it's a very valuable tool to give you some insight and you've never even been there before. But you can start to develop a plan um, and evaluate what's going on, identifying any problems that might be um, in that area.
Uh, you'll be able to determine an area of interest. Uh, they have different places um, or different ways to get there. Uh, you can type in an address. Uh, you can go to a county such as Putnam. This is actually, I think this is the fairgrounds. Is that the fairground? We can determine an area of interest and eventually we can get to a soil map that is going to give us some information about our location and different types of soil on this. And then within each one of these different soil types, there's much information. This is what they were doing back in the day in the 30s and throughout the 60s and 70s. Um, and then you can have a rating for each of your different soil types on what you can and can't do. Um, there will be some information on several of those um, different land uses, land classifications. Uh, you'll be able to find, we're going to use West Soil Survey to find uh, K factors, our slopes, different soil types, um, and some of the things that we can and can't do with those. All right, so um, is this showing up? Our presentations, this is coming up. Uh, our presentations are going to be next week. We're going to have a homework assignment due the week after that. And then I am going to move the test for module two until after spring break. So snow bit kind of gave us a little bit of time to breathe a little bit. I'm going to move those back. Our presentations, Ms. Kitty is going to lead us off. She graciously volunteered to go first. Um, is this posted? Is this posted in iLearn? I don't think it is. Not, not the order. Not the order? Okay, so I'm going to post this into iLearn. And also what I'm going to do is make like a OneDrive folder that you can upload your presentation into. Um, I'm also going to leave some instructions about how to uh, name those files so that when you put them in there, like I know which one, who's going where. Um, I did post the rubric. Has, has everyone seen the rubric online? Does everyone kind of understand what we're looking for there? Um, kind of kept that very simple. Uh, you don't have to be super dressed up, but also remember that you are giving a presentation. So maybe a collar shirt. Is I'm going to make Alicia wear her ambassador shirt. Um, but anyhow, five to seven minutes. Um, you get with your, you can see some of those presentations. Um, is Hannah here? Hannah, she is going to lead off irrigation. And do you have, like, is pivot and drip part of your presentation? Um, I'll do the four main parts of irrigation. Did pivot and drip make it in there? Yeah. Right, so that's going to kind of lead into um, Nathan and Chloe giving it the same day. Uh -huh. That is going to be on the 4th. And again, I will post those. I will post that online so that way everyone knows when they will be.
Anyone. We will not get a test back. 